What's up, everybody, and welcome once again to our directed Bible study on the seven signs of Jesus from John's Gospel. The first we saw last week as Jesus turned water into wine. The second sign is the healing of the official son in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Like last week, I want to pause for just a moment to give you an opportunity to pray and to read the passage before you dive into the rest of the video. I think that's imperative. So let me pause here, give you a chance to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart, and then to open your Bibles to read verses 46 through 54 of John chapter 4. Once we come back, we'll make four observations about the passage, and then you can answer the discussion questions on your own time. Take, take a break here and pause to pray and to read the text. I'll be back in just a moment. All right, welcome back to John chapter 4, our directed Bible study on John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. I'm going to read the whole passage to us and then kind of break it down with four observations uh, this, this afternoon. Here's the story that John tells in John chapter 4. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. Jesus has returned to Cana. He had gone on a trip to Samaria, and now he's returned to Cana. And at Capernaum, there was a, an official whose son was ill. And when this man had heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoke to him and went on his way. And when he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that the hour knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. The second sign. Four main observations for us today as we look into this passage. The first has to do with the fact that Jesus heals the official's son. Now, we're not told a lot about this official, but most likely, and most scholars believe, this was an official of Herod's court, a Gentile most likely, uh, a Gentile centurion, a Roman centurion who would have been stationed in Herod's court at Capernaum. He came to meet Jesus. Now, this is an important point, given the fact that at this point in the story of John's gospel, we have seen, if you've been following along or you're familiar with chapter 3, Jesus interacting with Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a leader of the synagogue. He was a Jewish leader. He was one of the um, Pharisees who taught uh, the law of God and lived it out very well. He was a member of the, of the court, of the council of Pharisees and Sadducees, as we find out throughout the rest of the book. He was a person who was clean and to be understood as a person who was clean and righteous before God by the people to whom he ministered. Then chapter 4 is the story of how Jesus goes to Samaria and he meets the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. And while he is there with the woman at Samaria, he offers her living water. She responds to his call of faith in her life. She receives the living water and she goes out and tells all of these people in the town of Sychar about Jesus. And they come and we're told in verse 39 that many Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. So we have Jews, a Jewish man, Jews represented by Nicodemus. We have the Samaritans, which were a kind of a mixed breed, a hybrid breed, if you will, of Jews and Gentiles believing in Jesus. And now we have this Gentile centurion, this Roman centurion. In these three stories, John shows us something incredibly wonderful and powerful about Jesus and his gospel, his good news, his kingdom. 
And that is that his kingdom comes to peoples of all backgrounds, whether they're good Jews, whether they're Samaritans, or whether they're Gentiles, that Jesus offers himself to everyone. We understand this in the history of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as the free offer of the gospel, that Jesus offers himself and his good news freely to all, and that the challenge and the call on our lives is to respond to that call in faith. And so we see that here. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, even in the story early pages of John's gospel. It kind of reminds us of what John tells us in the prologue of his gospel in verse 11 of chapter 1, when he says this, that Jesus came into his own, and his own people did not know him, and they did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed upon his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He came into his own, his own knew him not, they rejected him. But to all who did receive him, Jew, Greek, Gentile alike, Samaritan woman, if you received Christ, you you received the gift of adoption as a child of the living God. It's a wonderful point. The second point I I, I think this story makes for us is a picture, is I want to grab a hold of the picture of the centurion, his faith. There's several things about the centurion's faith here in these pages that I think are incredible, or in these words of this story that I think is incredibly important with reference to, to faith in the Lord Jesus, saving faith that you and I are called to have. The first, I think, and I'm going to bring my notes over just briefly here so I can make sure I get these right. The first is his sense of urgency, his sense of urgency. His son is at the point of death. He says, in fact, verse 49, if you have your Bibles there, Sir, come before my son dies or before my child dies. He is urgent. He has an urgent request to bring before Jesus. There's an urgency when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have some need for most of us, at least from the basic point this morning, if we're followers of Jesus, we have had a need of forgiveness of sins. There's an urgency to run and seek the forgiving grace of our Father who is in heaven. But there's also a trustworthiness and a humility. Look what he says here, a trust and a humility. Verse 49 again, sir, he approaches Jesus with humility, sir. Come before my child. He's trusting that Jesus is going to come, trusting Jesus is going to hear his prayer, his desire. Jesus told the man, your son will live, so go. And then in verse 50, he says, the man believed the word Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. There's belief that he believes what Jesus says and his action. That's the third aspect of faith we see in this man. His action, he goes home. Jesus says, go home, your son's going to live. And so he goes home. And then the fourth aspect to his faith that we see here is that when he goes home, he is obedient and uh, he is willing to commit his life long term to the Lord Jesus because he's experienced the grace and healing power of God. Look at verse um, 53 at the end. And he said, and he himself believed in all his household. He believed and he began to share the good news with his family and they believed. And this is a big commitment for a Gentile centurion in Herod's court. There would have been mockery. There would have been shame. The idea that the anointed one of God who is coming to the Jewish people is the savior of his life as well. That's an important point for us to keep in mind. There's a commitment of faith that is taking place here with this man. So there is an urgency There is a trust and a humility, there is an obedience, and then there is a commitment to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are four components of true healing faith and saving faith. The third main point is a point that refers to Jesus himself here. Uh, Jesus is gracious to give a sign. In fact, He says in verse 48, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But then he says, go, your son will live. I don't want to get into Jesus' statement about you see signs and wonders or you will not believe this today. 
But what I want to do is I want to point to the fact that Jesus says, go, and it will, he will live. And then this, the man goes home, and on his way home, he meets one of his servants, and they tell him his son is recovering. And he says, when did this happen? And it happened the exact time that Jesus said, go, your son will live. Here's the point that we want to grab about Jesus here. He doesn't have to be present. He has a healing touch oftentimes in people's lives in the Gospels, but he has a powerful word that's just as good as him being present and touching them. And I want to encourage you with that this morning because most of us are longing for signs and wonders and for how God is going to touch us and bring healing to our lives and cast us out of addictions and, 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 and fix our bad marriages and, and mend broken relationships and give us forgiving grace, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But the point is that Jesus has done that in his word, and his word is just as powerful as his touch. Jesus speaks it, and it happens. You don't have to be present. He speaks it. The power of God is in his word. He spoke the world into existence. Jesus spoke healing into this young man, and so it was. That's important. Jesus has that power. You and I don't. We don't name it, claim it. Jesus can speak it, and so it happens. And then the fourth main point this, for us today from this story is the benefit of affliction. If this man's son had not gotten to the point of death, this man wouldn't have gone to see Jesus. Had this man not gone to see Jesus, then Jesus wouldn't have reached out and responded to this man's faith by uh, giving the sign of healing. His son wouldn't have been healed. If this man's son wouldn't have been healed, in response to this man's faith in Jesus, then this man wouldn't have come to know the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, nor would his family have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and their family would have been lost in sin. You see, that's the benefit. I had a conversation with somebody today, actually, uh, about how God could potentially be using this situation to bring about his glory. And perhaps it is so that men and women and children can come to know the majesty and the glory of God through the healing power of Jesus and so come to place their faith in Him. Affliction has wonderful benefits for us in our lives. So those are the four main points for you this, for this Bible study and this sign. Gospel goes to all. The man has saving faith in Jesus. Jesus has the power to speak it, and it happens. And affliction brings about tremendous blessing and benefit in the lives of the people of God. That's the conclusion of the story of John chapter 4 and the conclusion of our Bible study today. May the Lord bless you as you dive into this story more deeply in the discussion questions which are listed below. May God bless you and have a great day. 